last night in coming to church, um, I heard word that a, a member of the congregation, a, uh, the husband of Marie Wooden, had been bitten by a rattlesnake and was uh, in ICU. And so we prayed in the service, then I went over there after the service, and um, you know, rattlesnake bites are a big deal, but in this particular case, it was a real big deal. Apparently, uh, young snakes, when they release venom, uh, they don't quit. In other words, they, they don't know how much to release, and so a lot was released in his body. He works at Teen Challenge in Lincoln, and um, within seven minutes of the snake bite, just walking along a trail and a snake bit him, um, he began to feel unable to breathe. His, he was, his uh, throat began to close. And uh, they had called, you know, thank God he was 100 yards from the office, uh, the ICU nurse that I talked to yesterday, who's, who's uh, dealt with a thousand, uh, I'm sorry, a dozen snake bites over the years. So this is the worst she had seen. And so here's a picture of um, his leg. Um, the, the bite uh, was at the back portion there, and, and they draw circles in time lapse as to how far the infection is spreading. Um, they came with ambulance and fire truck and was able to give him antivenom as soon as he got to the hospital. He was flying to Sutter Roseville and, uh, and the nurse had said that if he had uh, been a, a, in a remote place, that literally he could have died. That was the worst that she had seen in his leg. Another picture of him. Um, and um, his thumb was frozen. Only kidding. No, he's just giving a thumbs up there <laughs> as he's lying. But uh, I just think of the grace of God. And, and honestly, my message today, as it was last night, uh, is a bit more serious, a little more intense. Uh, it's kind of a life and death reality. And so uh, I had never been to a hospital with someone who had been bitten by a rattlesnake. And I felt it was in, ten in tenor uh, with the, uh, the message today that this was a life and death reality. And those are, uh, that would today up the ante in your own perspective as you hear this. What is God trying to say to you uh, that might provoke your life? Um, there was a, a woman who uh, had died of starvation, uh, and yet the, the bed she died on, and she had died uh, unable to remember things. Uh, she had gone senile there, and there was no one around. The bed she died on had $100,000 tucked in the mattress that she forgot she had. She was wealthy, but she forgot what she had. I think of another man whose mother died and he was uh, going to a lawyer to find out what she had left him in an inheritance. And all she left him was a large family Bible. He was not a believer, didn't believe in his mother's God, and so was discouraged by that, uh, took the Bible home, never opened it. But years later, when he began to battle depression, he opened the Bible, found a beautiful note from his mother uh, talking about the value of that book. And then uh, inside the envelope where the note was, was a, a good size, a good amount of money uh, to try to encourage him. She had given him an inheritance, but he didn't know what he had. He didn't know the inheritance he had been given. And I would say to you, if the God of the universe created you to be a son and a daughter, the God who makes galaxies, he has an inheritance for you uh, that is beyond anything you could imagine. And so God wants us to hear today what, what is the inheritance that God has for us. Uh, in my own life, and the message is fighting to possess your inheritance. Uh, my mother um, was a praying Catholic who had an unfaithful husband. Uh, my wife and I, a few months ago, were watching a documentary on Jackie Kennedy. And um, as I, we were finishing the documentary, I went in the kitchen, I thought it was over. My wife said, honey, honey, play that back. You need to see this. And when we played it back, we saw uh, this freeze frame uh, of Jackie Kennedy there. And then to the right, on the far right, is my mother uh, with that hat. Uh, my mother was a congressman's wife, and, um, you know, my mother was an intercessor. She was someone that, even as a praying Catholic, would pray the rosary. Um, and my father, even though my father was not a faithful man, and tragically, when he died that night, there were prostitutes in the room. Uh, I remember once at a political dinner, my father referring to my, to my mother, his wife, as a saint, my saintly wife. Uh, but he was not a faithful man, and so it affected 
My mother, as a young woman, she realized he was not faithful. Uh, there are some cultures, I'm Sicilian, and so there are some cultures where that's kind of a, uh, a natural, a common thing, unfortunately. And so when my mother went to her father and um, said that her husband was not being faithful, um, her father said, does he beat you? Does he give you money? And somehow that was like to be accepted. He's not beating you. He's giving you money. Accept it. Um, her father was not a faithful man either. My older brother walked in once with him and a maid. And so a generational issue is coming on my own life that I've had to deal with over the years. Uh, but I think about my mother and how she uh, stood in that gap as an intercessor. And uh, even when I got off into drugs and atheism and mocked her when she prayed over her food. And I had not seen her in nine months. Her prayers caught up with me. And last Sunday was actually 45 years to the day, Mother's Day, I got saved. 45 years to the day, May 14th, 1972, was May 14th last Sunday, when I walked into a little country church, received Jesus. And so my mother made an incredible impact on my life. Uh, and because of that, I know the power of prayer. I know that God can rescue lives. And I want to drop a seed in your own heart that perhaps you are the person that God wants to use to pray for and see a member of your family, someone you love, saved. Uh, my mother, uh, even though she was a praying Catholic over the years, she uh, grew in that relationship with God. She wound up getting born again. And her greatest years of intercession were 65 to 75. And so I did a video a few years ago about my mom's life as an intercessor. And here it is, my mother, the intercessor. Early church history tells the story of James, the half-brother of Jesus. He was such a man of prayer. His knees had large, thick calluses, making them look like the knees of a camel. James once wrote, Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. My mother was an intercessor. She stood alone, calling out for the broken lives of her husband, children, and hundreds more. Facing many challenges in her young life, she was driven to the only one who could help. A young wife with an unfaithful yet gifted husband, she shared her dilemma with her father. He quipped, does he beat you? Does he give you money? She could have fatalistically accepted her abandoned position. Instead, in time, she would take her plight to a higher power, a perfect father and husband who would become the love of her life. Day after day, week after week, she prayed. Soon hundreds of names were added to her list. Calls came from across the country. In time, it grew so long, she prayed for the saved one day, the unsaved the next, but for her children daily. Four hours a day, every day, she'd say in her thick New York accent, I'm praying my brains out. I know her prayers had power because I received Jesus on Mother's Day. Mom's prayer book tells the story, the worn pages of a willing life. No one who knew her doubted the power of her appeals. Now decades later, all of her children still know Jesus and we call her blessed. Each of us are learning to intercede in our own right for those we love. But the question can be rightly asked, where are the intercessors? Where are the warrior hearts who wrestle with God for the souls of men? Raise them up, O God, for we so need them now. You know, we really are in a life and death struggle. And the battle for our souls the Bible says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Uh, and so that life and death struggle at different points, we see clearly that God is trying to awaken us to our true purpose, our true destiny, who we're called to be. And yet the world tries to drown out the voice of God in our lives. Um, we went on a retreat this week to a place called the Home of Peace in Oakland. 
and uh, a bunch of us intercessors and pastors and leaders, worship team, and just spent uh, 24 solid hours in prayer, worshiping God, interceding, just claiming in our region, in our lives, for the Spirit of God to do something mighty in our midst. And I think about the, in your own life, my message again is about your inheritance. Uh, there's a portion of scripture in the Bible where it talks about the children of Israel who were held captive uh, in slavery in Egypt, which is a type of all of us in the world. Before we know the Lord, we are bound, we are held captive uh, by the, the evil powers of this world, Satan and his minions that, that hold us captive. But when we receive Jesus, we're liberated and we come out of Egypt, come out of the world, we cross the Red Sea, which is the type of water baptism. But the ultimate goal is not just getting free from the world, but learning to have victory in our lives in one particular area. We have a spirit, we have a soul, we have a body. When you receive Jesus, he comes to live in your spirit and he puts a, a tag on every part of your life uh, to be changed, sign Jesus. And as much as you yield to the spirit of God, he will change that part of your life. Your body will die, but your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, that's the battleground in your life. And so the, the, uh, the traveling from Egypt to the promised land was only an 11 day journey had they gone all the way there. But when they got to the, to the promised land nearby, they sent some spies in to check it out to see uh, what was happening in the land. And 10 spies brought back a, a bad report. Two of them brought back a good report and they believed the lie. And because of that, they did not go into their promised land. And for 40 years, they wandered in a desert rather than go into the inheritance God had for them. Go in to face the giants in that land. And we're going to talk about that today. So Numbers 13, verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses, who was leading them out of Egypt, send spies to the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. God has things he wants to give to us, nothing that we can earn or deserve. He wants to give us an inheritance but it will take faith to receive it. You will have to fight for it. You'll have to fight unbelief and doubt and fear and discouragement to receive the inheritance of God. But it is something being freely given to you that he has purchased for your life. And so at verse number 27, <laughs> excuse me, of Numbers 13, it says, then they told Moses, they said, we went into the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people, they were showing them giant pomegranates and grapes. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak. These are giants. We saw them there. And so they looked at the battle they were facing, and they were intimidated. They would not conquer those giants because they, they gave into fear, and yet the fruit was mighty if they had been willing to do that. And I think about the Bible says in Romans 8 that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. And so all of us are fighting that battle. We're, we're swatting the mosquitoes of unbelief and doubt and fear, believing the truth about who we're called to be, about the inheritance God has for us. And so I'm going to talk about certain consequences of you not fighting and not claiming your inheritance. Number one, if you lose sight of, your fruit, of the fruit, all you'll see is giants. You know, all of us are given an opportunity to be more than conquerors, as the Bible says, to walk in a place of victory. In the book of Revelations, it mentions, to him who overcomes, I will. To him who overcomes, overcomes what? Overcomes the intimidation of the lies of the enemy and is more than a conqueror for the, because of the grace that God has given to us. And so the fruit, I believe, is the fruit of the Spirit. Love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and long-suffering and self-control. Those are, are part of who God is. God is a God uh, who manifests those qualities, and he wants us as his son and daughters to walk in them as well. But the limitations come when we, are, we bow down to the fear. I want us to look at those those seven tribes that are in the land of Canaan. And when the Bible mentions their names, those names literally in the Hebrew have a meaning behind them. And that meaning in the Hebrew speaks of different battles and struggles we go through in our, in our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions. So here they are, the Hittites. Uh, that speaks of, that tribe speaks about confusion. Some of us are confused. God's not the author of confusion. 
Uh, it speaks of fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound, clear mind. Self-pity. When I was suicidal, I would spend hours lying in a bed, staring at the wall, feeling sorry for myself. I found out later on as I became a Christian that that self-pity is really the highest mountain in the mountain range of self, that I was absorbed in my issues and my problems. And it was, unfortunately, pride. It was uh, arrogance in my own life, feeling sorry for myself. And then discouragement. You know, it's lack of courage. We need courage to stand against that giant. The Gergeshites uh, speak of old sinful nature, old habits, old ways of looking at life. Uh, and God wants us to come out. You know, such were some of you, but you're washed, you're cleansed, you're justified. Amorites speaks of condemnation. The enemy just, you know, bringing up your past, bringing up your mistakes, bringing up who you once were or what you're doing. Even recently, you may have done things and, and the Lord says, you know, come to me. I'll, I'll cleanse you. I'll forgive you. I'll release you. But you've got to learn to, to cast aside the condemnation. Jesus said he did not come into the world to condemn us. He came into the world to save us, to rescue us. God's on a rescue mission for your life. And so you've got to learn to kill the giant of condemnation that beats you down. Then there's the Canaanites. Uh, all of us have failed. I ask that question periodically. Uh, would you stand, I ask, if you have lived the life you wanted to live? If you are the person you always wanted to be, would you stand? I've never had anyone stand at that point. No one's going, yeah, I am awesome. All of us can look at our failures, our mistakes, and, and those things can beat us down and discourage us. Then there's the parasites, uh, pride, anger, lack of discipline. You know, we look at those things in our hearts that, that we can boast in, that really uh, the Bible talks about whose glory is their shame. You know, the things that we have boasted in at certain points in our life, we should be ashamed of at times. Then the Hivites, sexual temptation. Um, you know, in my own life, uh, I've mentioned to you before that the, the number one area that I've had to battle with as a young teenager, you know, when I, uh, there was no internet, of course, but uh, when... Uh, Pornographic magazines were found in a dumpster and they were passed around by teenagers. That affected my life as a young boy. And so I had to deal with that in my mind. And, and so as a Christian, I've had to put hedges around that dimension. My daughters, when they were growing up and uh, during the summer, in their teenage years, uh, they would have just a J.C. Penney's catalog on a counter, and yet there was a swimsuit issue. It would affect my life. And I say, girls, you know, please, could you not leave that? I mean, I'm not Ted Bundy here, but please don't leave that magazine on the counter here. It's just not helping me, okay? And they understood. You know, it was confessing my need uh, to put a hedge of protection around my life. And then impurity, addictions, you know, the bondages of life, the things that we give ourselves over to that we become addicted to. Uh, and so what is your issue? What are the giants in your life? Uh, I'm going to share transparently a number of things today. Uh, about six weeks ago, uh, I had a dream. And in the dream, um, I found myself in a snare, in a trap. And it was a very vivid dream, very real. And I found myself just unable to get out of the trap. Get out of the snare. And I began to experience fear in my heart. Like, I'm not going to get out. I'm going to be trapped. I'm going to be caught in this. And when I woke up, I, I just said, Lord, what are you trying to show me? And he quickened me about my thought life. He quickened me. He said, you know, Francis, you, you've been giving into, uh, as, as he described it to me, uh, sleepy, sloppy thoughts. You've been allowing, you've not been bringing every thought into captivity. And sometimes you've allowed, you know, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop him from making a nest in your hair, you know? So uh, I have been allowing my mind to wander. And again, the fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. He began to convict my heart and I, I confessed it to my wife who was here in the last service confessed it to my intercessors. You know, I, I turned myself in. Again, you know, I'm, I am coming to turn myself in. I don't want to get caught. I've done enough autopsies on people who get caught, who didn't obey the Holy Spirit. You know, things spiral, and all of a sudden, they're blowing up their life. And at that point, it's a lot more significant. I remember a man who 
uh, was a pastor of a church of about 2,000 people uh, back east. And, um, you know, he had 12 churches that he had sent out. He had his wife and kids and grandkids in the church. So much to lose. And yet a tragic moment. Um, he wound up having a person who was helping ghostwrite his book. And they, they got into an adulterous relationship. And he actually ran off with her. Craziness. Finally, after a month, came to his senses. But at that point, everything was gone. He had lost everything at that point. And he went from taking care of thousands of people to driving a truck and taking care of thousands of bags of potato chips. And it made an indelible impression on my heart, you know, that, that we have so much to lose. All of us have so much to lose. And even now, there's something that God wants to do in your life in order for you to gain Control, once again, self-control over dimensions of your life that may be spinning out of control. And in those last six weeks, uh, I am uh, uh, like a heat-seeking missile locked on to kill those thoughts. I, I don't allow anything in my brain. I'm telling you, the fear of God is on me. Uh, and I'm grateful for that. I want to live with a sense of propriety, of, of holiness in my life. It's embarrassing to say it. I wish I could say I'm perfect and never broke a nail, but it's just not what's happening in my life. And so I have to deal with it. May you deal with it as well. And it reminded me of three different levels of conviction. God showed me many years ago that he embellished in this last season. They're embarrassment, fed up, and desperate. Most people live and die embarrassed. They think, I know I shouldn't do that. I know, you know, it's a bummer. It's a bad habit, whatever it is. You know, my father was angry and I'm angry. You know, all kinds of stuff that embarrasses them, but there's no transformation. They live and die embarrassed. Get it off you. Get it off you. Get it off you. Get it off you. If you don't get it off you, it may go on you and your kids, and all of a sudden that generation, the, the sins of the fathers is passed on to the children to the third or fourth generation. So I knew there was stuff that had to get off my life that I still am vigilant about. But if you, if you are embarrassed, all that means is you have an active conscience. There are people who have seared conscience. There are people who have given themselves over to evil, and they don't even feel bad anymore. They have given themselves over to evil. But even embarrassment will not change you. People live and die embarrassed. Beyond that is a place called fed up, where, where you sense the tug of the Holy Spirit, you know, that still small voice, you know, saying, walk you in it, you know, challenging you. And that's what the Holy Spirit did in that dream. He, he convicted me, Francis, buddy, come on, wake up, wake up to who you are, wake up to your true identity. Uh, but even then, people are fed up and they still don't respond to the Holy Spirit and see the change they need in their life. Beyond that is that place, the only place that people ever change. It's a place called desperate. In order for me to talk about my issues, you know, I as a pastor could put on this little mystique of togetherness and try and present myself as this perfect specimen. And I know there's more, there's more together pastors. I'm not knocking guys that had a holistic upbringing. That's awesome. My wife had a very, you know, whole upbringing. I've forgiven her for that. But, uh, you know, I just, I, I was dropped on my head. I was dribbled on my head. I have battles in my life that I've had to deal with in a real way. And so I can't present myself to you in a more holistic way than I am. That would be a Pharisee. That would be a hypocrite, you know? And so I think of the story, I've not told this in this church building. I think I told it in Bonita years ago. But um, I remember the story of a, a man who was in the lake of fire. And the story says that, that he was picking up people by the hair and looking them in the face and then putting their head down and picking up another person and looking them in the face and putting their head down. And someone asked, what are you doing? And he said, I'm looking for the pastor who told me I was okay. You know, the Bible says, preach the word, be instant in season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. You know, the Bible says that, that I as a pastor, as a teacher, will give an account for those things I share for the people that are under my stewardship. I don't want to spare myself to unintentionally deceive you into not making you discern the battle you're in. Again, I've done, I've done enough autopsies on people. Four years ago, William, one of my best friends in ministry, I had just preached a series on the life of David. 
I just walked in my house after the 11 o'clock service. My wife greeted me trembling with a phone in her hand saying she had just gotten word from Caron, the wife of this man, that he had confessed to her about an adulterous affair he had been in years before that finally had come to light. And um, I called him on the phone. He's crying hysterically. We already were going back to Florida to be with George Brantley, who was here a couple of weeks ago's sister, who had died of cancer. Godly woman, precious woman. So we were already scheduled to go, but we upped the day by one day, flew back Tuesday. We we're with David and Corona in their house as all hell is breaking loose. Just a tragedy. And I'm going to say the good news, four years later, they are doing great. God has restored their life. They are ministering, helping thousands of people. <laughs> Tragic, sad story may not happen to you, but it's a redemptive dimension of what God can do if we'll yield to the Holy Spirit. But that Tuesday was hell. Wednesday, we went to the memorial of George Brantley's sister, Cheryl, going, going to be with the Lord, celebrating her life. We went to heaven, celebrating her life. And then Thursday, we went back to hell again. But the dichotomy, the contrast between hell and heaven, between tragedy of falling and the blessing of finishing well, obviously makes an indelible impression on us. And so I want to be desperate to follow the Lord, to obey the Holy Spirit. Back to Numbers 13, verse 30. Then Caleb, one of the two spies who was thinking clearly, he quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had got up with them said, we are not able to go up and against the people for they are stronger than we are. You know, we all have the challenge to be a Caleb or a coward. I want to be a Caleb. I want to recognize that greater is he was in me than he was in the world. Greater is he, he was in me than the giants I'm facing. And all of the giants, you know, I could share my area and uh, it may not be your area, but I could mention fear. I could mention worry. I could mention depression, and you're going, now you're meddling with my life because that's a giant you're dealing with. You've got to face your giants. We all feel awkward mentioning our giants. We all feel awkward mentioning those issues that we battle with. So what, what is the principle? Consequence of not fighting to claim your inheritance. You see with eyes of fear, not faith. God wants us to believe that God is greater and that we will walk by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Every one of us are going to be challenged to face your fears with faith, to trust the Lord. Verse 32, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report. Ten of them gave a bad report, which they had spied out the land, saying, the land through which we had gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. We can see even something in our life that's a problem, but if we fixate on it and that's all we're seeing, that little problem becomes an obsession and all of a sudden our whole life, we're looking at our whole life through that issue. When the Bible says magnify the Lord with me, that means make God bigger, make God bigger, make God bigger, make God bigger, so that you're looking at your life through how big God is. You know, don't... don't don't tell God how big your mountains are. Tell, tell your mountains how big your God is. God's bigger than the mountains in your life. He's bigger than the giants in your life. Verse 33, then there we saw, the, the ten spies said, there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, who came from the giants. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. As you see yourself, so you are. Consequence, as you see yourself, so you are to others. Make confessions about how God sees you, about the inheritance God has for you. Begin to speak. David said, I would have lost heart if I had not believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Before I could see it, I had to believe it. I had to confess it. I had to speak life, speak reality over the temporary challenges of earth. Verse 1 of chapter 14. So all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. If only they had wept to have the courage to do the right thing. But they wept 
in fear. They wept in discouragement. They wept in unbelief. And the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. You know, if we refuse to go forward into the future God has for us, eventually we'll go backward, and we'll have a false sense. We'll, we'll find false comforts rather than rely on the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly. But Joshua and Caleb, who were among those who spied out the land, they tore their clothes saying, the land, and they're trying to challenge them, the land we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they're bred for us. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear. You know, if you want to be safe, the safest place for you to be is in the center of God's will. The safest place for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be was in a fiery furnace. The safest place for Daniel to be was being a lion's den. You be in the will of God. Paul and Silas in a prison, beaten. The safest place to be was there worshiping, singing, and God opened the prison doors for them. Unchecked fear will lead to rebellion. I'm telling you, you gotta kill unbelief in your life. Kill fear in your life. Track it down, kill it, find out. When I find out in my own soul, when all of a sudden I'm feeling weird, wait, 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 stop, stop, shh. I'm trying to figure out why am I feeling weird? What, what am I believing? What am I thinking? What's been said to me? What am I thinking that is making me feel weird? I believe God wants us to have hearts that are filled with peace. And when I find that thought or that word that was said to me or some kind of attitude, my poor response, I'm being convicted. I find that thing. I look at it square in the face and I reject it in Jesus' name. I speak to it and I, I ask forgiveness if needed. If I've hurt somebody, I ask forgiveness. But I deal with those issues in my life. I believe that God has called us to be at peace, to live that abundant, tranquil life. But it's gonna require us to, to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Here it is, unchecked fear will lead to rebellion. Verse 10, all the congregation. Now, people, because people don't want to believe the truth, and I've seen the most adamant, violent people against Christians are people who at one point knew what the truth was, and because they rejected the truth, they've been given over to believe a lie. And they wind up, like Judas, they wind up doing the contrary thing as opposed to humbling themselves and acknowledging it. Congregation picked up stones to stone them, these leaders. All of a sudden, wow, look out. God's come and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? How long will they, will they not believe me with all the signs which I performed among them? And I will tell you, None of us will stand before God and say, you know what, you didn't do anything in my life. Of course I didn't believe you because you never did anything of significance. All of us on the videotape replay will see that God had done exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all we could ask or think. And we are without excuse. God has done enough in your life to make you believe him. He's done enough in your life to make you reach out and trust him. All of us, I believe, can see that. But by giving into unbelief, you'll ultimately reject God. And God said, then my servant Caleb, verse 24, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully. You know, I want to be a Caleb. I want to be a Caleb, not a coward. I want to do the right thing and not bow to fear, or unbelief, or doubt. Because of that, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. And when Caleb finally got to the land, tragically, he had to spend 40 years wandering with the children of Israel. But when he finally got to the land, he got the inheritance. And then even as an 80-year-old man, he said, give me, give me that land. He's ready to fight. He goes, I'm as strong as I was on the day when I came out of Egypt. He, he was a man that was tenacious. I want to be that Caleb. I want to be that man that's tenacious all the days of my life. And here's the benefit of fighting to claim your inheritance. You pass on a generational blessing. You may say, oh, it's too late. It's not too late. You're still breathing. It's not too late. You can have spiritual sons and daughters. Awaken. My mother's best years were 65 to 75. You wake up to who you're called to be. Wake up to your inheritance. Wake up to your destiny. Fight for that. I believe people are on the other, waiting for us on the other side of our obedience. 
Final verse there, and worship team come. Uh, verse 30, except for Caleb and Joshua, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I, I would make you dwell in. You know, I, I tremble for all of us that we could live a life, know what the truth is, but never live victorious lives. You know, I know there's, there's sleepiness in this room. There's fog in this room. You're fighting to even stay awake to who you are. Seriously. Welcome to the planet, man. Welcome to the planet. When the Bible says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are that go that way, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there are that find it. Well, I read that as a baby Christian, and that got my attention. And I will tell you, over 45 years, I've seen a lot of folks go the broad way. They've come, and whatever happened to, whatever happened to, whatever happened to, So I'm going to stay awake, and I'm going to try and wake up as many people as I can. Yeah. These final, let's take a look, and we're going to respond to the Holy Spirit. These are the tribes, and these are the issues you're battling. I'm going to tell you, this is the most embarrassing dream that I will share with you. I had it in 1999. I hate talking about it because it exposes something in me and in us that is embarrassing. That weak, you know, when you give in to sin, you always think, why did I do that? Why did I do that? And so the dream though I felt for this message was appropriate, so I dug it out. It's in a book I did years ago called 2029. But here it is, on April, 14th, 1999, I had a profound dream. When I woke up, I immediately knew it was from the Lord. Through it, God exposed the depth of sin in my life. After lying in bed and praying for a while under tremendous conviction, I got up and recorded my dream. Here it is. Last night, I had a dream. I had left my home in the middle of the night and went to the house of another woman. It wasn't really a house. It was more like a bunkhouse, dark, dirty, with a dozen or more bunk beds. In some of the beds were her children. She had no husband. The woman was utterly unattractive, deranged, and dirty. I knew she was dangerous, but still I went to see her. On the surface, I was going to help her. Underneath was lust. Soon after arriving in this shady, dingy place, the woman reached out and gave me a long, sensuous hug. I did not resist. After a few seconds, without saying a word, I climbed into one of the bunk beds to wait for her. Everything was filthy, but I stayed and waited, longing for her to come to me. All of a sudden, the room began to get very busy. People started to knock on the door. Some of the children in the beds began to make noise. The woman became completely preoccupied. I was waiting in the bed for her to come to me. I was frustrated. Why won't she come? I thought, if we don't get this over with, someone I know is going to find me here. My sin will be exposed. I'll be ruined. I will no longer be able to be a pastor. I felt vulnerable. My life was now out of control. I had made my bed. Suddenly, people I knew began to come into the house. I hid under the covers. The room was buzzing with activity. More and more light began to flood the room. Oh no, they're going to find me. There was nowhere to hide. I knew these people. They went to my church talking to her and pulling on my covers, they said, and whom do we have here? I resisted their attempts to pull the covers off. Finally, they won. I was exposed. When they saw that I was their pastor, their faces were so perplexed and troubled. They asked, what are you doing here? Nothing, I said, nothing happened really, but no plea was able to cover my sin. I had no reasonable explanation because there was none. One by one, they began to leave the room, shaking their heads. I was overwhelmed with embarrassment. My heart had been exposed. 
as I looked over at the woman, she had a subtle smile on her face. She had never intended on fulfilling me, only destroying me. I woke up and immediately knew the dream was from the Lord. God was exposing the depth of sin in my life. He was showing me my desperate need to not only discern right from wrong, but to act on it. He wanted me to share it with our church family that others might be convicted as well. Our choices have eternal consequences. Personal revival is running toward the light and away from darkness, away from the seductive deceptions of earth to the liberating truth of heaven. Would you all stand, please? You know, there's a time in life, you know, all of us, when we're driving, you may have flashed on, what if I hit a child? What if I did something right now that I couldn't get back? And maybe you've done things that you can't get back. Maybe you're, you're thinking right now, there's something that I was involved in that set in motion a chain reaction. I, I have two aborted children that I believe I will see again in heaven. I have no sons. I have two beautiful daughters, but I have two sons that I named Caleb and Noah. I was a coward. When two girls were pregnant in college, I refused to have babies. I've been forgiven, but I can't get that back. Today, there's an opportunity for you to obey the Holy Spirit. Looking at that screen, what issue is the Holy Spirit speaking to you about? The Bible says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. I believe this is life and death. I believe it's not an accident that a snake bit a member of our congregation last night. And had he not been rescued quickly, he might have died. I believe that the Holy Spirit is trying to challenge you in the room. I'll just tell you prophetically, some of you have an indifference about your spiritual soul. You have an indifference about your life at this moment. And the Spirit of God is challenging you. Will you awaken to who you are called to be? I have found in life, I have met people that are coming closer to God for a season. And then when they don't respond, they drift off. And I've never seen them get close again. That was as close as they would ever be. I don't like talking about things in my own life. I don't like my wife sitting in the first row and me talking about these things, but I do that because I believe it's a life and death reality for me, and it's a life and death reality for you. Would you respond to the Holy Spirit? I'm telling you, you obey the Holy Spirit, and you face a giant in your life. No one's going to know what your giant is, but God knows what the giant is. You know what the giant is. Would you obey the Holy Spirit in your life? Would you run toward God and not away from Him? Would you allow, would you turn yourself in rather than at some future date get caught in a snare and not be able to get out?